You want to come in here and yell crew drive? Crew drive! Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you are new here, hello. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup while I do it. If you are into that, then make sure that you subscribe to this channel and also hit that bell notification because that's gonna let you know every time I do upload a new video. Although I do upload every Thursday, I am very predictable. Big Virgo energy. <laughs> True. So I do put on my makeup while I'm telling the story, but I don't talk about it too much. So if you are interested to see what I used or any of that stuff, then just check the description box because everything is linked just for you. So today's story is truly terrible, but I can't end this year, this terrible year on a bad note. So spoiler alert, this one has a happy ending. Okay, let me secure my bangses. Kind of in between this, like grow my bangs out, cut them back. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. On the afternoon of October 6th, 2002, 11-year-old Sean Hornbeck. Oh wait, did I tell you what the story was? This is the story of Sean Hornbeck. On the afternoon of October 6th, 2002, 11-year-old Sean Hornbeck asked if he could ride his bike to his friend's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. So Kirkwood is a small town about 60 miles outside of St. Louis, perfectly safe. Sean's parents, Pam and Craig Akers, had allowed him to ride his bike on countless occasions before, so they let him know to be home by 5 p.m. for supper and he was out the door. So the sun went down and Sean still wasn't back, which was very unlike him. First of all, he was a really good kid who listened. He wasn't some troublemaker. And second, and probably more importantly, he was afraid of the dark. Sean would never be out riding his bike alone in the dark Missouri woods. By eight o'clock, his parents filed a missing persons report with the local police. Pam and Craig were out all night looking for him and soon the entire community joined in and at this point they were convinced that he was just like hurt and lost somewhere you know so this search effort was incredible by morning over 100 volunteers joined law enforcement searching on foot combing through every inch of the area. I mean, had he fallen into the water somewhere? Was he lost in the woods? They searched the nearby caves, abandoned mines. They drained lakes with pumps. Thank you for telling me how that works, by the way. Canines detected his scent for a short time, but then the trail just went cold. He had disappeared without a trace. I mean, they never even found his bicycle. So the acres were destroyed. You know, they spent every waking minute looking for their son and they cashed in their retirement. They spent every last penny they had looking for him. Well, the days turned into months and then years. Sean was just gone. Pam and Craig felt so guilty for allowing Sean to go out alone that day, but they never gave up on finding him. They published a website, they formed the Sean Hornbeck Foundation, they did countless news interviews, a segment on Sean's disappearance aired on America's Most Wanted. They even went on to the Montel Williams show to speak with psychic Sylvia Brown. You guys know how I feel about her. She's a fraud. Well, the Acres were desperate for any information that could help bring Sean home safely and then do you know what Sylvia told them? Everything is trees, and then all of a sudden you've got these stupid boulders sitting there. And he could be found near He's there. near the boulders. Is he still with us? The bicycle is in another state in a dump. What a gut punch. Also, fuck Sylvia Brown. Don't speak ill of the dead. Oh, I'm speaking ill. She was a scammer, and you know it. On the afternoon of January 8th, 2007, 13-year-old William Ben Ownby got off of the school bus near his home in Beaufort, Missouri. Actually, am I saying that right? Hold, please. Okay, we're gonna go with Beaufort. Beaufort is in South Carolina and Beaufort is in North Carolina. How do you say it in Missouri? Leave it down in the comments. Beaufort, it's a rural, rural town in Franklin County, about 50 miles southwest of St. Louis. Ben was a Boy Scout and a straight-A student, and he always went straight home after school. The bus stop was just a short walk to his house, about 500 feet, and he typically got home just before 4 p.m. But that day, Ben's 15-year-old neighbor, Mitch Holtz, saw a white pickup truck 
bust a U-dog, like a U-turn. And then it raced off from the direction he'd been walking, and Ben was gone. I seen a white Nissan pickup sideways in the road, and it backed up and took off, and that's the last time I seen it. Well, it was so unusual for Ben to not, you know, get home straight away, so by 4 p.m., Ben's parents, Don and Doris Ownby, were panicked, and they called the police. Ben didn't have any after-school activities that day, and the speeding truck was just especially strange, right? So Mitch Holt's description of the suspicious pickup truck was the only real lead in the case. And let me tell you, the description that this 15-year-old kid gave was detailed. It turns out he was actually like a truck enthusiast, you know? It was a small white Nissan truck, rust and dents at the wheel wells, no hubcaps, and a two-inch trailer hitch, and a camper shell on the back with elongated windows down the side. He even described the tire tread. It's crazy. And he showed the police where the tire marks were, where the truck had peeled out in such a hurry. The only thing that he didn't remember was the license plate. Come on, Mitch. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, investigators were kind of like squinting at him at first, you know? That's a lot of information from this kid, but it was legit. So they took imprints of the tire track marks, um, you know, hoping it could pay off later. So press conferences were held to update the public and to plead for any information that could lead to Ben's safe return. And an APB, all points bulletin, was issued for this white Nissan truck, along with widespread media coverage. Now, Sarah, you said this was the story of Sean Hornbeck. What's going on? Well, as the hours turned into days, it started to sound really familiar, you know? Just like when Sean Hornbeck disappeared four years before. Well, Pam and Craig Akers heard the story and it hit them like a lightning bolt, you know? Deja vu in the worst way. About 45 minutes away at Emo's Pizza in Kirkwood, the owner, Mike Prosperi recognized that truck, the description that was all over the news. By the way, Emo's pizza is delicious and their toasted raviolis are the best. I didn't even know what toasted ravioli was until I went to hang out with Jamie French last summer. And you know, now I just dream of toasted raviolis. So thank you, Jamie, for ruining my life <laughs> and showing me some authentic St. Louis grub. Okay, so the truck. The truck was a perfect match for the one that belonged to his longtime manager, six foot four, 300 pound high school classmate, Michael Devlin. So Prosperi started doing the math. I mean, yes, he'd known Michael Devlin for 20 years at this point, and he wasn't the kind of guy, at least he thought, that would even be capable of such a thing. Like kidnapping a 13 year old boy? Michael Devlin had gone home sick the day that Ben Ownby disappeared. And Prosperi said that he was like pale, like he looked bad, so he went home early, which was something that was very unusual for him. Oh, I'm not gonna be able to talk and do this. <laughs> Hold please. Okay, where was I? <laughs> Michael Devlin going home early from work that day and it being suspicious. Michael Devlin was such a routine oriented, like driven kind of a person that any real deviation was enough to get the old spidey senses tingling, you know? So Mike Prosperi decided to drive out to Devlin's apartment the next day and really take a look at that pickup truck. And when he got there, he saw that white pickup truck, the camper shell, the rust around the wheel wells, the tow hitch. But what really made the hair on the back of his neck stand up was that there was red road dust on the truck. And that's something that you would only get from driving on dirt roads in the country. Not something that exists in Kirkwood, which is pretty much right, like right outside of St. Louis. Devlin had called in sick for the next two days. And if he was so sick, how did he get country road dust on that truck? His car matches the description of a kidnapper, of a boy taken from like a country area. Mike Prosperi called the police. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely remember both of these cases, especially the Ben Ownby kidnapping because it like revived the Sean Hornbeck thing. And you know who else heard about it was Michelle McNamara. Now you'll recognize her as the author of the 2018 book, I'll Be Gone in the Dark about the Golden State Killer. And you know, it later became the HBO mini series that was released in 2020. Michelle was a true crew crime pioneer. She deserves her own video for her many incredible accomplishments one being this case. Okay, so in 2007, Michelle McNamara had a blog called True Crime Diary that you probably all know about. So when Ben Ownby disappeared, she made the connection to Sean Hornbeck, whose case had gone, you know, cold after four years. She posted, 
Quote, One intriguing lead investigators should examine is a similar disappearance four years ago and 38 miles from Beaufort. Hang on a second. Do I have the locations backwards? No. Do I? Sean Hornbeck's home was in Richwoods, Missouri, not Kirkwood. Ben Ownby's home was in Beaufort, Missouri, which I did get correct. Kirkwood is where Michael Devlin lived. That's a lot of places to get. Sorry. Okay, back to Michelle McNamara's connections. So she continued, though Ben was two years older than Sean, he looked young for his age and both boys have strikingly similar stats. Interesting. So she included a map of the area showing each of the boys presumed abduction sites, both the same distance from I-44, which runs, you know, right into St. Louis, Kirkwood. So Michelle made that post on a Wednesday and by Friday, things had exploded. Had investigators been reading her blog? I don't know. And you know, she was never officially credited, but hold on to your butts. So FBI agents visited Emos Pizzeria on January 12th to talk with Mike Prosperi about the information he'd called in to police. While the agents were inside, Devlin was polite and cooperative, but he wouldn't make eye contact. So they asked if they could check out his truck, which he consented. One of the agents, Lynn Willett, was doing some mind judo on Devlin, asking him questions in a very specific way, like circular questioning, to see if any of the details in his answers might change. Basically, they were trying to find out if, you know, he had kidnapped Ben Ownby. He didn't actually have much to say about Ben, but as their conversation went on, he kept bringing up his godson, Sean. He said that his godson had been staying with him and, you know, as he was talking with this investigator, he was showing a lot of like physical body language that was screaming guilt to the agent. Wow, um, okay, I'm not gonna judge your journey. She later said that after about an hour, she realized that the Sean that he was talking about was Sean Hornbeck. After pressing just a little bit harder and telling him that they had matched his truck's tires with the imprints that they collected, Michael Devlin's head dropped and he confessed that he wasn't a good person. That's the understatement of the century. So now with Devlin in the car, the agents drove to his apartment in the 400 block of South Holmes Avenue calling for backup on the way. When they arrived, they walked Devlin up to the apartment to open the door and inside, seated on the couch, playing video games, were two young men. When the agents announced who they were, Ben Ownby rushed to the door. While the other kid just sat there, stunned, frozen. When they asked him his name, he told them, I'm Sean Hornbeck. <laughs> so let's, let's back it up all the way back to October 6th. 2002. So the day that Sean disappeared, he was riding his bike on Indian Creek Road after playing at a friend's house that day. Well, Michael Devlin was out hunting like the creep that he is. He pulled up alongside Sean, bumped him with his truck, and Sean went right into the ditch. And the next thing you know, he's got Sean's hands bound behind his back, duct tape over his mouth, and then he stuffed him into the truck. Well, Sean tried his best to squirm and struggle to get away, but Devlin pointed a gun at him to scare him. And he told Sean that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Gross. So Michael Devlin took Sean back to his apartment in Kirkwood about an hour away and just years of unimaginable torture and abuse began. Like the worst things you can think of. For the first month, he was kept gagged and tied to a futon. Every day, Sean would wake up afraid that it would be his last or, you know, sometimes even hoping for it. In late 2002, Devlin drove Sean out to a country road and strangled him. I mean, we can guess that he was planning to get rid of him. But Sean pled for his life. So essentially, he made a deal with the devil. You know, Devlin kept Sean Hornbeck locked up in his apartment for over four years. He threatened to kill Sean's family if he ever told anyone who he really was or tried to run or called for help. So Michael Devlin told his neighbors that Sean was his son and that the mother, Sean's mother had been killed by a drunk driver and he was homeschooled. I mean, I don't know how they didn't recognize him, but okay. So over time, Sean gained a little bit of Devlin's trust. I guess. He was allowed more freedoms 
you know, like time outside or being allowed to make friends. And I've actually probably seen him before and maybe even talked to him and not even re realize that that's who it was. He was even allowed to surf the internet and evidence was later found where Sean had posted on websites and forums that were dedicated to finding him, asking how long his parents intended to keep looking for their son. They said they'd never stop. Well, the neighbors, I guess, had no reason not to believe that Sean was Devlin's son and they even later told investigators that he spoiled Sean rotten and gave him whatever he wanted. Gag. Sean kept up his end of the bargain, I guess, because he never revealed his true identity. Michael Devlin's control over him was so absolute that even when Sean could have asked for help, he didn't. He even had sleepovers with one of the neighbor kids. And the neighbors even recounted a time where the story of the missing Sean Hornbeck aired on the news right in front of Sean. And they asked him, is that you? That looks like you, bruh. And Sean laughed and said, no, it's not me. Can you imagine? Well, after Sean had been rescued and they asked why he never tried to escape, he said it's because he was terrified. And when I was digging into this case, I found articles that were like really shitty about that point. You know, pretty much victim blaming Sean and saying that he was allegedly kidnapped or maybe that things at home weren't good and he left willingly. The situation here for this kid looks to me to be a lot more fun than what he had under his old parents. If that's what you think about it, you can eat a bag of dicks. How about let's not armchair quarterback an 11 year old kid for being afraid of a giant man with a gun, okay? Okay, anyways, so as time went on and Sean matured, you know, he was 15 years old at this point, um, Michael Devlin started getting bored with him, I guess. Also, Sean was so mind melted at this point. He existed in pretty much like a zombie state, you know, comply or die. And that wasn't much fun anymore. So Devlin started getting more worried that Sean might not be so easy to control. So he came up with a plan that would solve both of his problems. He wanted an upgrade <sighs> and he needed to make sure that Sean would never leave. Well, one afternoon, Devlin decided to kidnap another boy and to force Sean to help him, making him, you know, culpable or at least making him think that he was. Well, that kid ended up being Ben Ownby. All right, hang on a second. I gotta, let me just, let me just mascara real fast. Well, creepo Michael Devlin had been lurking around Beaufort, Missouri for weeks and he zeroed in on Ben Ownby. So as I said before, Ben was 13 years old, but he presented, you know, much younger looking. He had a small build and he was about the same size that Sean had been when he was taken at age 11. One afternoon, Devlin told Sean, we're gonna go get him. Well, instead of agreeing quietly, like he usually did, Sean went nuts. He argued with Devlin late into the night, screaming at him about how no other kid deserves to endure what he had been going through for the past four years. The next day, Michael Devlin went to work as usual, but he came home early and he forced Sean to get in the truck. Well, he knew what was about to happen and he made a silent promise to himself to do whatever he could to protect this kid. So Sean later told investigators that they drove about an hour to Beaufort and they parked in a residential area for like nearly an hour until a school bus finally arrived. It was uh, one that Devlin had already staked out. So he watched two boys get off of the bus, one being Ben and the other being Mitch Holtz. They went in different directions. So Devlin approached Ben to ask him some random whatever question to get his attention. And then he pointed a gun at his face, forcing him to get into the truck. Well, Devlin didn't realize that Mitch Holtz had noticed him and every detail about that truck. Well, Sean comforted Ben and he told him that as long as he was quiet and did what he was told, he'd be okay. Once they got to the apartment, Sean knew what was in store. So he bargained with Devlin, telling him, leave him alone for now and I'll do whatever you want. It's heartbreaking. I mean, of course, the disgusting Devlin took him up on this offer, um, but he still went after Ben, doing terrible things to him over the next couple of days. Sean knew that he was being replaced, essentially. So he said, the days got slimmer, you know? When you get a new car, what do you do with the old one? You get rid of it, right? Michael Devlin had Ben Ownby captive 
for about four days by the time they were rescued. Let's cut back to this dramatic rescue, right? So the police have busted up into Devlin's, well, took Devlin and he let them into the apartment and they found these two boys, one of them being the missing Sean Hornbeck. Then they were able to call the Ownbees with the incredible news. They have been, hooray. And then the county prosecutors were able to call the Acres, who at the time, um, they say that they were driving down the road and they had to pull over to gather themselves. And it took us a few minutes to pull over, so it seemed like it was forever. And did you at that time think it was the worst news? And then I heard Craig say, he's alive. Oh my goodness. When I heard that. So through a thunderstorm, like a raging thunderstorm, Pam and Craig raced to the sheriff's department. Minds racing, you know, the world seemingly going in slow motion. I mean, they couldn't get there fast enough if they'd been able to teleport. Rescued, reunited. Can you believe it? Ben Ownby and Sean Hornbeck adjusted back to their previous lives. Presumably much easier for Ben, who had only been, only, been gone for four days, vice four years. The entire state of Missouri was elated. Neighbors hung banners and sent cards and gifts, and Sean's rescue was called the Missouri Miracle. Well, Michael Devlin, monster, he had no criminal record, no history of any kind of behavior that, that would even hint at something like this. He was born on November 18th, 1965. He was adopted into a large loving family. He worked at the pizzeria with many of his other family members. No history of abuse, nothing that would explain what he turned into. Even so, Devlin was charged with 80, 80 counts of sexual assault, kidnapping, and attempted murder. He pled guilty on all counts, and he confessed all of the nightmarish details in court, and he was sentenced to 72 life terms. A little more from Michelle McNamara, if you please. Her incredible attention to detail, and for lack of a better word, obsession, kept her very close to this case. She listened to countless interviews with Michael Devlin's family members. In an interview with Michael Devlin's brother, Michelle noticed him mention family vacations on Lake Michigan. So she dug in and learned that Michael Devlin's father owned a home in Southwest Michigan near Lake Michigan. There also happened to be a case in nearby Benton Harbor where the victim closely resembled Sean and Ben. Unfortunately, no official connections were made. There wasn't enough hard evidence to proceed with charges and all that. But as of 2019, Devlin continues to be a suspect in the case of five other missing boys, including a Canadian man who says that Devlin attempted to kidnap him as a child in 1998. On April 9th, 2011, Michael Devlin was attacked during breakfast at Crossroads Correctional Center in Cameron, Missouri. He was stabbed repeatedly by another inmate armed with a shiv made from the metal guide bars of a typewriter. Very creative. Devlin suffered superficial wounds, probably because he was so big, but he recovered and is currently serving his sentences. After Sean was rescued, he attended private school and then he went on to work in a metal fabrication company. He lives a very normal, quiet life with his wife and kids and he often does outreach for families with missing children and helping those who come home to recover and adjust back to normal life. Ben Ownby also disappeared back into normal quiet life and he lives in the St. Louis area. Well that, friends, is the incredible story of Sean Hornbeck. This is the last crew crime story of the year so I'm really happy that we could end on a high note. <laughs> So, like I said, if you want to know what makeup I used today, then just check down in the description box. I do my very best to link everything in case you're looking for it. And th there are a couple of things that are no longer available. Sorry, this is limited edition, but I'll, I'll list something that's close. <laughs> so going into 2022, I plan to keep making these crew trend videos every other week. I also want to start working through all of the states 
in the union. I've already mapped out where I need to go and I'll tell you it's gonna take a while. Okay there's 50 states plus a few territories and such so good thing there are plenty of terrible stories to tell. If you have a crew crime story that you would like to recommend then just send me an email that's down in the description box or you can just leave it in the comments. Remember I'm trying to work through all the different states so if I've already covered one please still recommend it. We'll get to it eventually. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here every week and you can follow me all over the place. So many places. <laughs> um, that is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Guide bards. Bart. Bards. Bard! Do I? Hang on a second. 2000. Fuck you car. A little bit more about Michelle McNair. Devlin, ow. But also, Sylvia Brown can eat a bag of dicks. Oh my god, these cars. Then just te- <sighs> Is there a helicopter? Go away, I'm building. Ow, motherfucker. Oh, the fucking litter box is going. <laughs>